Hello, I'm Hans Brinkman and I would like to share with you my views on maintaining close connections with a city or country because that can help your career. One of the many sources of inspiration for a writer is a lifelong connection with a certain place, a city or area or even a country. And in my case, I have maintained a special connection with Japan. Beginning in 1950, when I arrived as an 18 year old Dutch banking trainee. And over the years, my relationship with Kyoto has grown especially strong. Before I tell you more about that, first a few details about my background for those of you who don't know me. I was born in The Hague in 1932, February, as the only son of a self-made businessman. In the late 1930s, my parents, my four-year younger sister Sonia and I moved to Wassenaar, a suburb of The Hague. My parents were divorced in early 1940s. Fortunately, my mother met another man, Jan de Jong, an inspector of education in the pre-war Netherlands East Indies, now Indonesia, who happened to be on home leave when Germany invaded Holland and was not able to go back. In fact, he never went back to the East. He became my stepfather in 1943. Shortly after the end of the war, we moved to Amsterdam. At high school, I studied hard with special interest in everything that had to do with language and literature. I wrote articles for the school magazine, magazine and also edited it. I even launched my own little publication, a little um, newsletter with contributions from my stepfather and several friends. I typed it on a Remington typewriter. With the help of carbon paper, I could produce 10 or 12 copies. It was clear what I wanted in life, to study language and literature and after university develop a career as a writer. It turned out to be an impossible dream. Post-war conditions were bleak, there was no money for a higher education, and my efforts to obtain a scholarship failed. What's more, there was a fear that the Cold War would eventually turn hot, and my stepfather advised me to leave the Netherlands by finding a job with a bank with offices in Asia. After graduating from high school at age 17, I was introduced to the National Handelsbank, a Dutch bank with branches all over Asia. Together with 12 other young men, they took me on for their year-long internal staff training course in a suburban villa, a kind of private college. A year later, in June 1950, I boarded the motorship Oranje, which took me to my first posting, Singapore, followed four months later by a transfer to Japan. I was assigned to the Kobe branch, then located on the mezzanine of the Bank of Tokyo's Kobe office, now the Kobe City Museum. When I reported for duty in December 1950, there was no desk available for me. Instead, I was in assigned to a little table previously used by a messenger boy, and it was there that I, that I started my Japan banking career. Two months later, the branch moved to a proper office, and I got a proper desk. The first two years, my work was my main focus. After work, 
We went for drinks together with Dutch colleagues to Kobe bars and nightclubs. That was our only relaxation. By early 1953, I started making short trips on my own. Before long, I discovered the charms and history of Kyoto and began to spend weekends there, walking the streets, visiting temples, and getting to know local artists. I even went up to Mount Hiei, north of Kyoto, on a snowy day. Once, as I was trying to buy a ticket for Kyoto at Kobe's Sanomiya station, in my limited Japanese, was, which was normally well understood, the clerk behind the window answered in a rough raised voice, no English. I patiently repeated my request in Japanese, of course, and this triggered another shout of no English. I went around the back to complain to the station master. He apologized and invited me to sit down. He noted down my complaint and then got me the ticket I re required. He has been drinking very bad, he said, nodding in the direction of the off offending clerk who was now sitting sullenly in a corner. The next day, the station master unexpectedly appeared in my office with his obnoxious clerk in tow. The fellow, now the very image of contrition, was made to apologize with deep bows to me and to Mr. Waimatsu, our senior clerk, who was always on hand whenever a member of a Dutch staff got into a scrape. The peace offering, a large box of cakes, was distributed among the staff. The reaction in the office to this rather embarrassing incident was very supportive and made me feel that I belonged there. In 1954, I was transferred to Tokyo. And during my two years there, I sorely missed Kyoto's atmosphere and ancient culture. In February 1956, I left for Holland on my first home leave. After six years service, without official holidays, I was entitled to six months vacation, too long by any standard. It also turned out to be financially disastrous. Our normal salary was suspended for the length of the leave and replaced by a tiny monthly stipend, as it was assumed, that your family would put you up and feed you. Well, my parents did, and I showed my appreciation by inviting them one day and my four-year younger sister to a holiday trip to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. To my immense relief, I was reassigned to Japan, this time as sub-manager to the Osaka branch. I rented a three-room Western-style wing of a fine Japanese house in Ashia, an attractive suburb halfway between Osaka and Kobe, I had found a housekeeper, Komatsubara-san, a kindly soul and a devout Christian who tried to lure me into her church, but I was firmly uninterested. She promised to keep praying for me anyway. Many a weekend I spent in Kyoto, where I visited the temples. At Tofuguji, a major Rinzai Zen temple and monastery, I became friendly with a senior monk. After a few visits, he confided to me that he suffered from stomach ulcers and rotting teeth. He put this down to Shojin Glory, the monastic diet consisting mostly of boiled turnip and potatoes, rice gruel, soybeans in various guises, and lots of tea. He also complained of painful joints. 
from all the squatting, that he believed the discomfort was necessary to gain satori. Asked if he had reached that enlightened stage, he just laughed. I visited other temples like Kiyomizudera. I found a small cheap inn near the Tofukuji, the Takeya Ryokan. Its futons were thin and the rooms unheated except for a small hibachi brought in whenever I returned. But the Takeya's owner and his family were friendly and the food was tolerable. There was so much work in the office that I could not afford to go out for lunch. I was making long hours and frequently canceled dinner at home. The hunger was attacked with strong boy brand chocolate and nut bars bought by the dozen. My Kyoto weekends were a badly needed balm on my shaky physical condition, but I was struggling with the classical problem of reconciling East and West. When I was at work or with friends, our language was Dutch or English and our logic and thought patterns European. In Kyoto, I had to rely mostly on my limited Japanese and identify myself with a more tentative, less assertive mode of being. Well, in, in June 1957, I visited an exhibition at the Sankakudo Gallery in Kyoto entitled, entitled Poems Before Words. The poems were written by Paul Reps, an American poet associated with the Beat Generation. They were written on washi, handmade paper. Rebs' poems were very brief freehand calligraphic texts accompanied by little Zen-like drawings. The washi poems suspended from twine strung horizontally along across the airy space of the gallery were fluttering in the soft breeze coming through the open windows. The poetry the paper, the settings, it all touched a chord in me. The exhibition with ticket prices ranging from 1,000 yen for automobile owners to 10 yen for lovers of Buddha was a benefit for a Kyoto poet, Shimaoka Kenseki, Ken for short, whose life, whose wife, was seriously ill in hospital. I paid 500 yen as I did not own a car and loving Buddha seemed too American a concept. I met both Reps and Shimaoka and bought a few of Reps's poems. I also bought his book, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, a collection of his Zen writings. Shimaoko and I ended up going out together and friendship blossomed. In the following months, I spent many a weekend walking the streets of Kyoto with Shimaoka, whom I now called Ken, following him around like an acolyte, his master. And the master looked the part following uh, uh, with a great basket-like Zen hat, topping his dark suited frame and his gaze always forward. Up and down the hills he took me, in and out of temples and shrines and gardens, visiting artists and potters and monks and hermits. We shared meals in noodle shops and sushi joints and drank to each other's health in disreputable nomia drinking places. Once Ken and I met in Osaka over dinner at a small restaurant. 
Ken suggested an after-dinner drink. He knew a small bar in Osaka called Lamour, and he wanted me to meet Shirayuri, the madam, a former geisha. It was a simple place with bare concrete floor and only three or four hostesses. They slid off their stools to welcome us. One of them was very attractive, shy and pensive. Behind the bar stood, stood a woman in her early 50s wearing a sober blue-gray kimono. The bar madam. We talked. She lacked the coquettish manners of the typical bar madam, madam and seemed more interested in the kind of person I was than how much I would spend. Sometimes she looked at me thoughtfully. After a while, Shirayuri invited the pretty girl to join us and then asked her softly to open her hands. She blushed, but when told it was all right, she opened them slowly. What we saw were two blackened palms. She was a Hiroshima survivor, her hands being the only part of her body that was exposed to the fatal flash. This done, she visibly relaxed. We could not stay long, but I promised to return, which I did twice. But although Shirayuri was always very kind, the place de depressed me. And when the Hiroshima girl left, I stopped going. On a, one day, a, a clear-eyed visionary received Ken and me in his Spartan tea house, which he had built on a wooded slope near Kyoto with the help of several followers. He prepared matcha for us, mixing the green tea powder and cold water from a well with a bamboo whisk and served it in self-made pottery bowls. Noticing my interest in the delicate tea whisk, Ken next took me to a whisk maker in Yase, a bosky village north of Kyoto. The whisk maker, a young man with a pretty wife holding a baby smiling behind him, lived in a small hillside house. It, I was impressed by the dedication with which this man practiced his noble but humble trade. Once again, I detected a quality in the Japanese attitude to life that in its very simplicity seemed to me superior to the more ambitious lives lived in the West. I purchased two of his beautiful whisks, one of which turned a lustrous dark with age I still had. The light was fading when we returned to Kyoto and Ken suggested, suggested a drink and a bite. So we dropped in at an Odenya where we had been before. It was full of men seated on stools at the square wraparound counter with the mamasam in the center stirring the oden under the shop's only lamp. We managed to squeeze in and ordered sake. The mood was jolly and Ken contributing a story or two soon became the focus of attention. Then he began to boast about me calling me the second Lafcadio Hearn. I told him to stop this exaggerated talk, pointing out that my knowledge of Japan could only be described as mere sengaku, shallow learning. I should not have said this, said this for Ken took my choose of choice of this particular term as proof of his claim. I squirmed under the unwanted attention and was grateful when the quiet young man opposite me, who had been observing me through the smoke and steam, began to play his shakuhachi flute in the half shade. One of Ken's more inter interesting, interesting introductions 
was to a lady by the name of Ichida Yae. She lived with her teenage daughters in one of Kyoto's last grand mansions, built in traditional Sukiya style. Yae-san was the scion of an old established family of textile manufacturers, but she preferred the life of literature and had gained some renown as a poet. Admirers called her the 20th century Onono Komachi, the legendary poet of the Heian period. With Ken, I joined her at a party at her home. On New Year's Eve, 1957, I joined a group visit to the Yasaka Jinja, the Yasaka Shrine in Kyoto's Gion district. The group led by Ken included several of his friends, some of whom I already knew, and Yae-san, as always a sight to behold in her mock Heian getup. This was the annual Okera Mairi, the obeisance to the Shinto deities enshrined at the Yasaka shrine. In the shrine's precinct, a large charcoal fire, fire the Okera B, was burning in an iron basket held aloft on a huge tripod. Pilgrims would buy a straw rope from the shrine's office, and after setting it aglow at the fire, take it home, twirling it all the way to keep the tiny flame going. And once home, the New Year's first kitchen fire was lit with its small spark. The hundreds of tilting red circles moving through the cold and dimly lit streets resembled fireflies chasing their own tails. The crowd jostled, jostled against us. And as we tried to negotiate our way out of the shrine compound, I suddenly found myself alone with Yaisa, with no trace of our companions. I put a brave face on it and suggested a bite in a local bar before calling it a day. Yaisan graciously accepted. We gave our glowing ropes to some passing children and headed for the Arino Nakiye, a fashionable hangout. It was well past midnight when we sat down on stools at the long counter and placed our order. Our arrival caused a minor flutter, which I did my best to ignore. Further down, I spotted Edward Seidensticker, the well-known translator of Japanese novels by Tanizaki and others, whom I had not met by, but knew by name. He gave us a friendly nod, no doubt recognizing Yae. Tanizaki had used her as a model for one of his heroines. When it was time to pay, I found my wallet gone, obviously lost to a pickpocket at the shrine. Seeing me flustered, Mr. Seidensticker offered to help out, but Yaya-san insisted on taking care of the bill. The incident was watched with barely suppressed curiosity by the, the bar's other patrons, adding to my embarrassment. The president, excuse me, I continued my wanderings around Kyoto with Ken. The range and variety of his network was astonishing and not confined to the eccentric and the artistic. Through him, I got to meet, among others, a Nanga painter living in a large house featuring a full-sized no stage, a manufacturer of electric machinery, a gynecologist and his jolly family, 
the owner of an obi and kimono weaving mill, and Matsu, Matsui Sotokichi, a building contractor. More about him later. Each of these encounters revealed some aspect of Japanese life that I found interesting. Well, I also met Ken's two daughters. The president of the machinery manufacturer, Kuroi Denki, a subcontractor sub of the giant Matsusta Electric Company, later renamed Panasonic, personally showed me around his large and very clean plant. Afterwards, he had me over to a working lunch in the company canteen. In appreciation, I brought him a week later a meter long smoked eel, paling, a Dutch delicacy. It was part of an order placed with a smoking house on Lake Hamanako by a group of Dutch residents suffering from culinary nostalgia. I can still re recall his shock as the big, big eel's head with its sharp teeth popped out of the wrapping paper. Not surprisingly, Ken often had some sort of business with the people he took me to. An example was the gynecologist who wanted his help in finding a tenant for an empty retail space he owned in Kiamachi Shijo Sagaru district of Kyoto, right on the narrow Takasegawa River. My former girlfriend, Fuji Takako, had some experience in the catering industry and wanted to start a business in Kyoto. She thought the gynecologist's space would be just right for a small restaurant, a Dutch restaurant at that, if I would be prepared to act as advisor. It would, of course, be the first Dutch eatery in Kyoto, if not in all of Japan, and it should feature I decreed, besides those delectable eels, a choice of hearty soups and hashes, and as the house specialty, a veal, veal and bacon rolls, known in Holland as blindvinken, blind finches. It's rather inaccurate translation, Mekurano Suzume, blind sparrows, sounded so intriguing that it clinched the decision to go ahead. A friend of Takako designed the interior. I arranged for a large antique copper kettle and some Dutch crockery to be air freighted from Holland. We all worked on the menu and within two months, restaurant boer meaning farmer, opened for business. It got off to a good start, and I dropped by whenever I could to check the authenticity of the food cooked by Takako. I also continued my weekend meetings with Ken. One night, in a rustic restaurant, our poetic veins opened wide over the vapors rising from an enticing shotsuri, shotsu hot pot, and my friend and I exchanged impromptu poems. Here in a historic corner of Japan's ancient capital, sharing a meal with a kindred soul, I felt I, I, I had at last found my true home. The crass and self-centered West that had borne me seemed far away and irrelevant. I knew I could live without its hard surfaces and never-ending arguments. I had come to value the receptive ear over the clever mouth. The chirping cricket to the bombast of a Wagner symphony. 
Perhaps I thought Kyoto would allow me to live here and accept me as one of their own. After this experience, I wrote an essay entitled A Letter to Kyoto. It was published in a Japanese magazine in Ken's translation. I will read the first two paragraphs to you in English. A letter to Kyoto. Seven years long I have knocked on your doors and searched for your soul without finding it. Yesterday I rested and what I had looked for was suddenly there. I did not find it as you would find a marble or a flower. I did not see it as you would see the moon or the ocean. It was seeing without object, a knowing without reason. In a moment it was too long or too short to be measured. I saw you with my inner eye and you, Kyoto, looked back and recognized me. The unwise say that cities are but dead heaps of stone and clay. But of you, that is not true, Kyoto. You are blushing with life. I know because I heard your breath in the pines of Nanzenji. I felt your heartbeat in the corners of Kawaramachi. I saw your tears on the rocks of Shirakawa. It went on some more, but I stop here. But more than 10 years later, in 1970, this essay entitled Kyoto-san was republished as the lead article in the inaugural issue of Koto, meaning ancient capital, and illustrated quarterly about the old capital Kyoto. A memorable discovery in Kyoto was an inn I stayed at, the Yorozuya Ryokan, dating back to the Edo period, when it had given shelter to travelers arriving from or setting out for Edo, the legendary, along the legendary Tokaido Highway. Its successive owners had meticulously preserved the original atmosphere of the inn and its furnishings, down to the last inkstone and wood-fired bathtub. There were no glass panes in the windows, just double paper shoji, which were protected from the elements by the deep overhang of the roof. One afternoon, the owner sent word that he would like to invite me to tea. I found him squatting behind a low desk, a dignified man in his fifties. When I entered, he turned around and moved from his cushion to the bare tatami and with a bow thanked me for honoring him with my visit. I protested that the pleasure was entirely mine, but he said there was a special reason why he had wanted to meet me. I understand you are from Holland, he said, and I have always wanted to meet a responsible Dutch person with an understanding of Japan to express my profound thanks. Thanks for what? I wanted to know. Ah, we Japanese owe Holland a great debt for everything it has taught us during our more than two centuries of self-imposed isolation. But for Rangaku, Dutch studies, Dutch medicines and shipbuilding and botany and all the other sciences, Japan would have been an ignorant and backward country, an easy prey for empire builders. But our Meiji men were prepared because of what they, what they learned in Dejima. And I, as a Japanese, want to thank you and your country for what you have done for us. With this, he made a deep bow. 
his little moustache practically grazing the floor mat, after which he ordered the maid to bring tea and sweetmeats. I did not hesitate to use this little incident, this touching little incident in an interview for a Dutch magazine, the Holland Herald. By now I was spending most of my spare time in Kyoto and I was thinking of moving there. But to go house hunting, I needed a temporary base in Kyoto and that's where Matsui-san, the, contract, the contractor, came in. He and his wife kindly offered to put me up. And when he heard I was looking for a separate place for my housekeeper, he said they had two guest bedrooms. So I gave notice to my Asia landlord and moved my little household to Kyoto. Matsui-san was trained as a traditional joiner, specializing in fine houses and temples, and lived with his young family in a spacious house in Yamashina, a Kyoto suburb. From here, I commuted to work in Osaka and on weekends went around with an estate agent looking at houses. Smitten as I was with everything Japanese, I wanted something authentic, part of a temple, an artist's studio or a sukiya style house. But after weeks searching, I had found nothing remotely meeting my expectations and my limited budget. Then I thought of Gion, the famous Geisha district, with its exquisite wooden houses and its mixed aura of sadness and gaiety. I asked my estate agent what he had available in Gion. He looked doubtful, but nevertheless took me to one of those deep and rather narrow geisha houses, which he said could be held hands cheap because there had been a fire. The top floor was gutted and part of the roof was missing. What decided me against it was not that, nor the price which I could have managed with a mortgage from a local bank. It was the sudden realization that living in Gion while working for a Dutch bank in Osaka was a cultural leap too far. I called off the search and eventually found a house in Nishinomiya between Osaka and Kobe, not far from my old neighborhood. Thanking my generous host for putting us up and storing my belongings for three months, I ordered a removal van. The faithful Komatsubara-san rode along with the van's driver. It was October 1958, and because of my continued stomach problems, my doctor had advised a week's holiday. So once again, again I opted for Kyoto, where I had actually never spent more than a day or two at a time. I checked in at my usual inn, the Takeya, and hit the road often with Ken, visiting temples, taking a walk in my favorite bamboo grove. It was not until later in the week that I finally got around to paying Shirayuri-san a visit. Ken had told me that she had started a small Japanese restaurant in Kyoto and that she hoped to see me again. Well, she greeted me warmly and insisted that my teppanyaki steak be on the house. We talked. She brought me up to date on her story and then asked what I planned to, when I planned to return to Holland to get married. I replied that there was no one waiting for me and that in any case, I'd rather find a wife in Japan. She seemed surprised and with a twinkle promised to keep an eye out for me. By the way, she asked, what does your father do? 
The next morning, I was sleeping late in my tatami room when the telephone disturbed my state of bliss. It was Shirayuri. This is a faithful record of the first part of our conversation. She said, I promised to look out for you and decided to get busy right away. I couldn't, couldn't tell you this last night, but I know a lovely Ojo-sama in Nagoya. Her name is Yoshida Toyoko. She is studying Japanese literature and speaks English and wants to go to America or something. Your type, exactly, I think. She belongs to, please, Shirayuri-san, I'm still asleep. Hold it. I'm not ready for this. Can't we talk about this some other time? I'm sorry, but the girl is already on her way. This bit of intelligence managed to finally wake me up. I'll spare you the rest of our conversation. The result of Shirayuri's kind introduction is what matters. Toyoko and I met at the Shokaro Inn and restaurant near Restaurant Boer. We clicked instantly and four months later we got married at the Netherlands Consulate General in Kobe, followed by a rather grand reception at the Kobe Oriental Hotel. Our wedding attracted some attention in the English language newspapers. Meanwhile, my stressful working environment further aggravated my stomach problems. I finally consulted a specialist who diagnosed the early stage of stomach ulcer, the result of years of bachelor's neglect. He ordered a month's holiday away from that bank. He also prescribed medication and a strict and very bland diet. With luck and perseverance, surgery could be avoided. I did what I could to forget that bank for a while. With Toyoko, I took up pottery making and we visited kilns in Tamba, Amagasaki and Kyoto. One of the potters we visited was Kato Sho, whose kiln was in the grounds of my favorite Tofukuji temple in, in Kyoto. We liked his work and bought two of his rustic tea bowls. We met several times and years later in 1972, we organized an exhibition of his work in our Tokyo apartment, which was attended by over 20 friends. All Kato's work on display was sold on the spot. Among our Japanese friends was a, I'm sorry, month, most of the month's rest was spent writing. Toyoko and I also worked on a translation of a story by Satomi Ton, Urenuko, which was eventually published in the Dutch literary magazine Tirade. After leaving Japan in 1974, excuse me, I skip one paragraph here. Among our Japanese friends was a young man, Abe Tsunehiko, who worked for Japan National Railways. He was about to get married and asked us to be their formal go-between at their wedding ceremony, which was to be held in at the Nanzenji Temple in Kyoto in April 1961. We agreed and the event was reported in the Mainichi Daily News. After leaving Japan in 1974, Toriko and I lived in five other countries before returning to Japan in 2003. We had a rich life together, thanks in no small part to her creative and inquiring mind, sense of humor and keen interest in the world around her. 
Sadly, she passed away in Tokyo in 2007, 48 years after our memorable Mihai in Kyoto. I had quit banking in 1989 after a seven year stint in New York. And then I took up writing as my new career. Over the years, I have published eight books, six of which with Japanese themes. Three of the books were published also in Japanese in excellent translations by Hiromi Mizoguchi. All of my books, except the self-published Monkey Dance, about my wartime memories are available on amazon.co.jp and most of them also on other Amazon uh, platforms, including my latest, The Call of Japan. I've also given many lectures in various countries, again, mostly related to Japan and some specifically related to Kyoto. Hiromi's translations of my essays and short stories have been published regularly in Atlas, a Japanese literary magazine based in Kanda, uh, Tokyo. Each of the past 15 editions have featured one of my writings, including two stories from my book, The Tomb in the Kyoto Hills, published in 2011 which won a literary award in 2016. In 2019, John Dugill of the Writers in Kyoto group invited me on the recommendation of Juliet Carpenter through Hiromi Mizoguchi to give a lecture on my Kyoto connections at Ryukoku University in Kyoto. My talk with many PowerPoint illustrations was well received. In 2020, Ken Rogers, managing editor of Kyoto Journal, published a laudatory review in the journal of my most recent book, The Call of Japan, together with an excerpt from the book with photographs. Then this spring, after joining writers in Kyoto as a member, I participated in a short story competition and to my surprise won third prize for my brief account of Restaurant Boer, mentioned earlier, and my Miai meeting near there with my future bride in 1958. Clearly, my long connection with Kyoto has been richly rewarded. As you see, after all those years, part of me is still tied to Kyoto. I've always felt in tune with its citizens' awareness of the fundament fundamental place Kyoto held, holds in Japan's long and ancient history. And with that, dear audience, I conclude my talk about the importance of maintaining close connections with a country or a city, in my case, Japan and Kyoto. Thank you for your attention.